I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. Well, you guys, I actually don't have a whole lot of news or anything to talk about, so I'm going to jump right into this case. Today we're going to talk about Victor Salva. He is a filmmaker, a director, and a pedophile. Big ol' slimy creepo. So, let's start from the beginning. Victor Salva was born on March 29th, 1958 in Martinez, California. He was born to a religious family. His mom was only 18 when he was born, and his dad pretty much split not not very long at all after he was born. After he abandoned the family, Victor's mom remarried to an abusive drunk. Victor developed an interest in horror and sci-fi at a young age. In 1975, the local newspaper reported that Victor had seen Jaws in the movie theaters 55 times. By the time Victor graduated high school, he had written and directed more than 20 short feature films. He worked two jobs after school to afford these projects. When Victor was 18, he came out as homosexual, and his parents kicked him out of the house. In 1981, Victor was working at a daycare where he met Rebecca Winters. He was making one of his little horror sci-fi short films. It was called The Goblin's God. Rebecca was helping him sculpt the goblin's face, and according to her, Victor soon became a close family friend. In 1986, he directed the 35-minute film Something in the Basement, which starred Rebecca's 8-year-old son, Nathan Forrest Winters. According to Nathan, Victor spent the better part of a year grooming him and his parents. It was a calculated process of gaining their trust, and Victor was like, when Nathan was a little kid, like 7 or 8, if he fell and scraped his knee, Victor was like the guy who he would run to. He didn't have a father figure, and he loved Victor like his own dad. Around the time Nathan turned 10 was when Victor started abusing him. In 1986, when Victor was 28, his film Something in the Basement won first place in some some competition, and it won a few awards. And that caught the eye of producer Francis Ford Coppola. And he would end up producing Victor's first theatrical feature, Clown House. Victor casts Nathan in this film, who is now 12 years old. Clown House was fairly successful. It screened at Sundance, and Coppola actually loaned them the cameras from the George Lucas film American Graffiti. By the time they're filming Clown House, Nathan's now 12, and he's having a sexual relationship with him at this point. And Victor was getting, like, ballsy about it. Like, he was becoming cocky. Nathan said that on the set of Clown House, Victor was more and more open about the affection towards him, and Nathan would often sit on Victor's lap in the director's chair. Nathan's mom, Rebecca, started to feel like something was wrong, and she started to ask a lot of questions. She just felt like something wasn't right. Victor actually told her that she couldn't go to the set, so like she wasn't allowed to come with Nathan to rehearsals, because according to Victor, Nathan couldn't work if she was there. That just reeks of Polanski vibes. Victor had also been asking Nathan to stay late for extra rehearsals. So she kept asking Nathan, and he just insisted that nothing was happening. Nobody was hurting him. Nobody was touching him. But he had a really hard time lying to his mom. People in the cast and crew actually went to Nathan's mom and told her that this was getting weird. Like, it was getting increasingly inappropriate. So Rebecca, of course, kept pressing Nathan. A couple days after they finished shooting, Nathan told his mom, I have a secret that I need to tell you. He told her what was happening, but... He was also trying to protect Victor, and he tried to, like, he tried to tell her very little. Nathan actually doesn't remember his mom's reaction when he told her. He thinks he blocked it from his memory. But he remembers that she was crying all the time back then. So Nathan told his mom, and she called the police. The police went and raided Victor's home. It was actually a sting operation. In his house, they found a big old stash of kitty porn. There were videos, there were photo albums with, like, pictures of little boys modeling underwear, like pictures from a Macy's catalog or something. And they also found pictures in home movies of countless little boys, and also a video of Nathan and Victor performing oral sex on each other. They found Victor just a couple miles from his home, and they arrested him. He admitted that the whole porn collection and the home movies of himself performing sex acts with children were all his. And so he went down for, like, including lewd conduct, oral sex with the person under 14, and procuring a child for pornography. Coppola got Victor an expensive lawyer, and Victor retracted his confession, even though he's in some of the footage. 
but the lawyers tried to keep him quiet. Then, Coppola actually sued Nathan's family for $5 million for some sort of breach in contract. Nathan's attorney went to them with the plea bargain, which basically dropped six of the most severe charges, so of course Victor's team agreed to it. Victor was sentenced to three years in prison, but he only served 15 months in jail. He never went to a prison. And then as part of his sentence, he went to a treatment facility in Napa. And he had movie deals waiting for him when he got out. As part of the settlement, Nathan was required to see a therapist until the age of 18. Nathan says that this did help him a lot, though, as he had been suicidal since he was seven years old. Francis Ford Coppola was definitely present for a lot of the filming, and some scenes were even filmed inside his home. He said, I didn't know of anything improper going on, although I witnessed some things that caused me to raise an eyebrow. Only in retrospect did things really add up. You have to remember, while this was a tragedy, the difference in age between Victor and the boy was very small. Victor was practically a child himself. Again, Nathan was 12 and Victor was 29. There was also an interview where Coppola talked about it, and he talked about Nathan like he was like a little harlot slut boy, like he was talking about what he was wearing, like he was in little shorts, like totally sexualizing the child. Nathan still had to do a lot of work on the film, even though they had finished shooting. Because they had borrowed these old-ass cameras from George Lucas, the cameras made a ton of noise, so they basically had to dub over the entire film after it was done shooting. Meaning throughout this whole investigation and trial and everything, Nathan still had to go to Coppola's house to work for months. This whole thing was really heavy on Nathan during his teen and his preteen years. Nathan felt like he had lost his best friend. Not only that, but the local newspaper had released an article about Nathan, and they mentioned him by his full name seven times. So when he got to school, everybody was talking about him and making jokes about him and just treating him like shit altogether. Plus, Coppola straight up told him, you'll never work in this industry again. So his acting career was over. He struggled with not only suicidal thoughts, but also drug abuse and hypersexuality. Victor only served 15 minutes in jail, but while he was there, people did find out that he was a child molester and he was beaten beyond recognition. He told the news that he was terrified while he was in there. The movie Clown House premiered at the Sundance Film Festival while he was in prison. While he was incarcerated, he also wrote five scripts, including Powder. After he completed his parole, he took a little hiatus from filming. He worked as a telemarketer for a while, and he would spend a lot of his time going to producers and delivering scripts that he wrote, but he would pose as a delivery man. In 1995, he made a direct-to-video film called Nature of the Beast, and then later in 1995, Victor got the chance to film Powder. If you've never seen Powder, it's a Disney film, and it's pretty weird, but it's pretty good, I guess. I haven't seen it in years. I was little. But I'll, I'll never forget it because, like, it was the first time I learned about albino people. It's, like, about an albino boy who has special powers. It's supposed to be a very heartwarming Disney-type movie. And, yes, the fact that it was a Disney movie was a huge deal. When the movie was released and it was revealed that Victor Salva was going to be a part of this film, the details of his conviction resurfaced. Disney's people denied that they had any knowledge of Victor's history, and they said that they found out about it in the middle of the film's production. They supposedly approached him about it then, and then key production people were told to keep a close eye on him. But according to Victor, everybody knew about his past already. Which, like, how is a company like Disney going to hire an established filmmaker and not know anything about him? I mean, do they not look into the people that they hire to work with children? <laughs> I think we know the answer to that. Either way, he was not removed from the project. But there were two crew members from this film that reported that Victor would hang around two extras who were minors. Allegedly, Victor would take them out to lunch and he would let them sit in director's chairs. After the whole scandal came out, Disney's people released a statement saying that Victor Salva served his time and what he did eight years ago has nothing to do with this movie. The movie Powder opened on 1,500 screens nationwide and was pretty successful. Nathan was about 20 years old when he found out that Victor Salva was making another movie with Disney, and it broke him. He was at work when his aunt called him and told him, and he had to, like, hold back tears, and that's when he decided that people need to know what Victor did. 
He believed that Victor should not be allowed to work with children ever again. So he showed up with a bunch of people at a premiere or a showing of, of powder to protest it. They had picket signs and brochures, and they were stopping all these important film executives, and they were giving them leaflets, asking them not to support this movie, and saying that it was just helping line the pockets of a child molester. In a statement at the time, Victor said, I paid for my mistakes dearly. Now, nearly 10 years later, I am excited about my work as a filmmaker and look forward to continuing to make a positive contribution to our industry. He did another movie in 1999 called Rites of Passage, and then in 2001, he wrote and directed the film Jeepers Creepers. It was a huge hit, so he went on to make Jeepers Creepers 2 in 2003, and then Jeepers Creepers 3 in 2017. There were a lot of delays to the production of Jeepers Creepers 3 because of Victor's history. So this guy... When he was casting for this film, he put out a casting call for an audition for... Here's what it said. He was looking for an 18-year-old to play a character whose stepfather made overtures at her when she was 13. And then there was a scene that it ended up being cut from the theatrical release. But originally there was a scene where the young girl, Addison... She's the one who no longer lives with her stepfather because he was, like, making passes at her. So some other character in the movie is romantically interested in Addison, and he says something about the girl's stepdad. He says, can you blame him, though? I mean, look at her. The heart wants what it wants, am I right? And that just seems like making a lighthearted joke out of something really dark. I've never seen these movies, but... Supposedly, Victor Salva had a belly button fetish, and it's said that in his movies, like in the Jeepers Creepers films, that he has a lot of close-up shots of male actors' belly buttons. I have noticed, though, that in clips from Clown House, there are quite a few scenes where Nathan is shirtless, and in one of them, he's in a bathtub. Throughout all of this, Coppola has been very supportive of Victor. When he got out of prison, he gave him $5,000 to help him get a head start, he was apparently the one who vouched for Victor to help him get Jeepers Creepers on its feet. Coppola said, Victor has talent, and that talent in itself is good. We don't have to embrace the person to believe that their art is a contribution to society. Coppola would also help him finance his films. Victor says that he served his time, and he's trying to make up for it and redeem himself. He says he's apologized to Nathan, and he's paid his dues. But of course, Nathan and his mom, Rebecca, disagree. He hasn't paid his dues. He served a 15-month sentence, which, compared to this child's lifetime of trauma, I mean, that's mind-boggling. Nathan Forrest Winters no longer works as an actor. He continues to speak out and spread awareness about the prevention of sexual abuse. He now writes and performs music and has his own band. There is a fourth Jeepers Creepers movie coming out. It's called Jeepers Creepers Reborn. So far, there's no mention of Victor, nor is he listed as a producer. However, Victor has rights to the franchise, so it's not really known if he's going to be a part of it or not. I'm guessing they just don't want to bring up his name and stir things up yet. Other than that, he's not really working on anything noteworthy. But he is still out there. Nathan has done several interviews on the subject. He recently did a, a documentary with somebody named Connor Frazier. And the movie, I think originally it was called The Babysitter, but, but now it's called The Boy. And it's all about Nathan Forrest Winters and his relationship with Victor Salva. I saw an interview where Nathan said that he didn't really realize what was wrong until Victor was arrested. He said that before he even realized that there was something wrong with an adult and a child having that kind of relationship, what he noticed first was how big of a problem it was to be homosexual. Because this was the mid-80s and this kid was like 12. So there was a lot of fear about AIDS and homosexuality going on during the 80s. So the way he explains it is that at school and stuff, calling somebody some kind of uh, slur for being a homosexual was like the go-to. So he first started hearing about that stuff in school and that's when he started thinking something was wrong. And by the way, these interviews don't sound like he has a problem with gay people. He's just describing the impression that he had as a kid in the 80s. But it does seem like Nathan has always known that he's heterosexual. So I'm thinking maybe in part that's why it felt wrong to him too. 
I'm going to play you a short clip from an interview. But again, when you're a victim, you, you teach yourself, you train yourself to be conditioned to not listen to your gut instincts, to not listen to those, you know, sirens going off, the, you know, the, and to ignore the warning flag. So um, it really, uh, it, it wasn't until after he was arrested, I really started to discover just how wrong it was. And that's all I have for you today. If you enjoy this podcast, please remember to tell your friends and give me a positive review on Apple and on BrokenLimelight.com. Don't forget, you can always check out BrokenLimelight.com. And there you can find an almost complete transcript of this episode along with videos, pictures, all that stuff. You can buy merch there too. Check it out. It's pretty cool. All right, guys. I hope you had a good holiday weekend. Until next time, bye-bye. Today's episode is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly mystery subscription box that's truly one of a kind. It's basically like a true crime case in a box. It comes with case files, codes to decipher, detailed backgrounds about the suspects and the victims. There's evidence for you to evaluate. It tells an immersive story of a whole crime case from beginning to end. It's kind of like an escape room in a box. You can do this by yourself, or you can team up with a buddy, or you can do it for like a game night or even a date night. You can take a little break from technology and immerse yourself fully into this box. Or if you prefer to be a more high-tech investigator, you can join online communities and talk to other Hunt a Killer players about clues and stuff. Hunt a Killer also shares part of the proceeds to the Cold Case Foundation, so your purchase actually helps with real-life cold cases. The best news is that Broken Limelight listeners get 20% off of their first subscription box. So go get started now at huntakiller.com and don't forget to use the code BROKENLIMELIGHT to get your 20% off. That's Broken Limelight, all one word.